Good afternoon. Welcome, everyone. Thanks for joining us today for the keynote panel of our Free and Fair Elections Symposium. I'm Janet Napolitano, uh, former president of the University of California and Secretary of Homeland Security and Governor of Arizona. I'm now proud to be a professor at the Goldman School of Public Policy at Berkeley. Uh, and uh, we are establishing there a new center on security in politics. Uh, in coming to the university this past year, I, I founded the center in order to connect uh, the security studies that are being done by the amazing faculty at Berkeley with policymakers and elected officials who can ensure real world change. Today's symposium brings together those on the front line of the critical nexus between election issues uh, and the, the conduct of our elections, which really goes to the fundamentals of our democracy. Uh, this panel features election officials in some of the key battleground states from the 2020 election, Pennsylvania, Arizona, and Michigan. We'll also be hearing from a leading official uh, from the Department of Homeland Security. Last November, all eyes were focused on today's panelists and how the elections in their states were being conducted. These officials not only faced intense scrutiny, but had to confront a series of unsuccessful lawsuits, among other things. Today, we'll take a look back at this incredibly turbulent time and look ahead to see how we can confront pending legislation in the states and across the nation that seeks to change the way we conduct elections and ultimately think forward to 2024. So it's my pleasure now to introduce our outstanding panel of experts. Jocelyn Benson is Michigan's Secretary of State, where she works to ensure that Michigan elections are secure and accessible. Jocelyn is the author of State Secretaries of State, Guardians of the Democratic Process, the first major book on the role of the Secretary of State in enforcing election and campaign finance laws. Katie Hobbs is the Secretary of State from my home state of Arizona. Previously, Katie served in the Arizona House and in the Senate as Minority Leader. And she now focuses on ensuring that Arizona elections are secure and fair and efficient. Josh Shapiro was elected as Pennsylvania's Attorney General in 2016. Josh previously served three terms in the Pennsylvania State House and was twice elected to county commissioner in Montgomery County. And Matt Masterson is a non-resident policy fellow with the Stanford Internet Observatory. He recently served as senior cybersecurity advisor at the Department of Homeland Security where he focused on election security issues, and he also served on the US Election Assistance Commission. So thank you all for sharing some time with us this afternoon. So uh, let's harken back to uh, last fall when you were preparing for the 2020 elections. Um, and uh, I'd like to explore with you uh, uh, two things. Uh, one is, uh, did you take any special actions in light of uh, then President Trump's contention that the only way he could lose the election was if it were rigged um, in order to uh, make sure that uh, uh, um, you could prove the opposite if that were the case? And the second thing I'd like to explore with you is um, uh, how you um, uh, dealt with COVID and uh, changes in your state's uh, election uh, procedures. Uh, so Secretary Benson, why don't we start with you in the great state of Michigan? Do you want me to take both those or just the first right now? Why don't you take the first one? Okay, 
So yeah, I mean, we saw early on that there were going to be uh, that misinformation was really going to be the biggest threat to election security and misinformation, particularly perpetuated by those in our country with perhaps the largest platforms of anyone. So this question of how you protect voters' minds from being infiltrated by lies uh, in a way that would ensure they'd still be able to have confidence, rightly place confidence in the security of the elections was one of the most significant things that we were planning to tackle throughout the year. Of course, things changed a year ago today when we got our first uh, cases of the coronavirus reported in Michigan about two hours after the polls closed in our presidential primary, which was also a year ago today. But I'll talk about that later uh, with regards to the misinformation coming from the president at the time and the, the threats and the challenges, which we in Michigan really experienced in multiple ways throughout the, last, the past two years. Uh, our focus was really on three things. Number one, building the infrastructure to ensure that our elections were successful, uh, making decisions to, particularly post-COVID, make sure citizens knew their options to vote, that they had confidence in exercising those options, and that the infrastructure itself was secure. Uh, and the tabulation process as well was uh, efficient and secure. The second uh, pillar was to make sure that we educated voters about that infrastructure so that they knew proactively what their options were to vote and also that they could have faith and know everything we were doing to secure their vote. That enabled us to prepare for the third pillar, which was countering misinformation and overall securing the, the process. And in many cases leading up to the election, efforts to put robocalls and robocalls to our voters and things like that didn't land in Michigan because we had already effectively educated so many voters about how to vote absentee, for example, or vote through the mail, uh, that efforts to deter that were not really successful and that were quickly reported to us so that we could hold those bad actors accountable. But finally, the, the biggest challenge was really after the polls closed. And we knew from the moment the polls closed to the moment we had our unofficial results announced in Michigan that there would be a space for bad actors, particularly the then president, to sow seeds of doubt quite intensely about uh, the results of the election or to question it or to declare victory. And so we planned for that by with transparency and with efficiency. We, throughout every step of the way, every moment from when the polls closed close to when we had our unofficial results, which is actually only about 24 hours due to our work to increase the efficiencies of the tabulation process, we delivered content to the national and local media through social media to our voters about exactly what was happening, exactly what we were doing to tabulate and protect the vote. Uh, and so that we were able to also announce the results, the unofficial results, two days sooner than we had predicted and then everyone was anticipating. So that, at least in Michigan, really stymied the efforts of bad actors to use that period to sow seeds of doubt. Of course, we know after the fact that the full two months or three months remaining uh, were used in very creative ways uh, to um, through a PR campaign and uh, other ways to, to file lawsuits to without any evidence to try to undermine again the people's voices in the process. Uh, but the work throughout the year that we had done to really solidify the process, ensure it was secure, ensure people had faith in it and participated in it, and then ensure in that particular moment uh, that we maintained control of the narrative and, and, and pushed the truth forward with regards to the security of the vote and the tabulation process. That enabled us to do it successfully and, and really, again, though the the, the months that followed, you know, from the time when people showed up outside my home to, um, you know, protest and all the rest um, were quite challenging, but we always had the truth on our side. We always had the voters and their voices to protect. Uh, and that also helped carry me and others through that very challenging stormy moment in November and December uh, because of the work we had done the truth was on our side, the votes had been counted securely, and we knew that ultimately democracy would prevail. That's great. Katie? Elections are very different from state to state, but I imagine a lot of our preparations look very similar. And Secretary Benson um, touched on a lot of the preparations they were doing in Michigan, and we were doing the same things here in Arizona. Um, she also mentioned uh, going into the election, knowing that misinformation was our biggest threat to election security. We had the same focus in Arizona. Um, and so it was really important that we were focused on um, what we were going to do to combat that. 
We uh, engage very early with the National Association of Secretaries of States um, trusted info uh, campaign to help make sure we were pointing voters and the public to those trusted sources of information and that they knew where to get the accurate information. And we continued um, throughout the entire process from our presidential preference election all the way through um, beyond the election in November, um, continuing to put out information through social media um, and other uh, avenues um, to, uh, to give voters information, to explain the processes, to show um, all the ways that we were transparent and that people could participate in the processes so that they, uh, part of how we keep them fair. And, um, and then we created a series of resources after the election focused on what um, was happening to demystify the process and really just continue to combat all of that misinformation. And, and quite frankly, we say misinformation, but it's lies. There were so many lies about the election and, and th that is still happening here in the state of Arizona. Um, and so, so really putting um, together a robust public education campaign was one of the most important pieces of election preparation, particularly when you put uh, the COVID pandemic on top of that, um, which I think really served to amplify the misinformation and uh, the potential for voter confusion. Yeah, yeah, that's that's uh, that, that, that's right. We'll circle back to COVID in a minute. Um, Josh, you were the <clears throat> attorney general. Um, what were you doing before the election to prepare and? Were you working with your fellow state attorneys general? Um, uh, was DAGA involved or RAGA or can you tell us what was sure. going on? Yeah, absolutely. Well, first off, it, it really is just an honor to be here with everyone. I mean, we we saw in this last election just how fragile our democracy uh, can be. And um, but for a handful of secretaries of state and judges and attorneys general and governors across this country, the results really could have been catastrophic. And it really is just an honor to be with these great defenders of, of democracy. And I watch them enough on TV. It's really wonderful to now be with them for this conversation today. Um, for us, you know, we were dealing with many challenges. Madam Secretary, you touched on these at the beginning, right? For, for us, the four big challenges were, of course, COVID, which everyone was dealing with. Uh, Trump and his enablers, willing to just lie, and Katie's right to call it what it is. These are lies, not just disagreements or misinformation. And then we had another challenge in Pennsylvania in that we were dealing for the first time with a new law that allowed for vote by mail. Um, other states were far more advanced than we were on that. Uh, and so for us, you know, we, we recognize coming out of our primary, which was pushed back, it was in June, very late primary due to COVID, uh, that we needed to really get our house in order and get prepared for what I expected to be certainly an onslaught of lies, but also an onslaught of uh, litigation leading up to the election before any vote would be cast. And so I took uh, my team together, both the folks who do affirmative litigation, our appellate folks, our criminal folks, uh, as well as our civil folks, and we established three teams leading up to election day. And I called them, um, you know, Team A was the team that uh, would take us until uh, 6.59 a.m. on Election Day. Team B was our Election Day team to ensure that we had a safe and smooth election. That was primarily our criminal folks. And then Team C was going to be the folks who were going to have to likely litigate the results. So first, we wanted to secure and protect every vote leading up to Election Day, ensure that people had a smooth day on Election Day, and then uh, post-election day, make sure that all votes were counted. Um, that, that team worked diligently. We, we communicated multiple times every single day where needed. Um, I relied on my colleagues across the country, including uh, the amazing Dana Nessel from Michigan and many others who were dealing with some of the, the same legal challenges that we expected to be dealing with in Pennsylvania and, and ultimately did. Uh, we had to beat back 19 lawsuits from Donald Trump and his enablers before a single vote was counted, or pardon me, cast. And then we had to deal with another 21 um, uh, lawsuits once those votes uh, were cast, including some uh, lawsuits that took us all the way up to the United States Supreme Court. At the end of the day, 
we had a safe and smooth election. At the end of the day, uh, each and every legal vote was counted here in Pennsylvania. But I think it's also uh, a truth that at the end of the day, um, there's some real damage that was done to our democracy. And we've got to do some truth telling here in Pennsylvania and across this country to repair the damage that was done by Donald Trump and his enablers who are still working to not just undermine what happened in 2020, but make it harder for people to vote going forward. I'm sure we'll get into all that, but you know that's that's how we prepared going forward with those three teams. And ultimately we, we proved to be successful in making sure every single legal vote was secured, protected and counted here in the Commonwealth. You know, we've been talking about the pre-election um, uh, contentions by President Trump and his enablers, but I think um, 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 uh, before the uh, election, the, uh, some thought, what were the Russians going to be doing? Had they just gone away since 2016? Um, uh, Matt, can you kind of uh, bring us up to speed about what was going on in that, in that score? Yeah, absolutely. And I, I want to echo uh, what the Attorney General said. This is such an honor for me to be on, on this panel uh, with folks that I uh, had the privilege to work so closely with, like Secretary Hobbs and Secretary Benson. Uh, this election, uh, in many ways, is, is a uh, tribute uh, to the incredible integrity of our election officials, both the Secretaries of State, but the thousands of election officials at the state, county, township, city levels uh, that knew their job, uh, knew uh, <clears throat> that uh, it was up to them to uh, uphold our democracy and did so with courage, uh, with bravery, in the face of threats, lies, uh, and, and everything else. And so uh, I hope as we reflect on 2020, there's obviously the, the uh, incredible uh, negatives, uh, but also the positives of the professionalism, integrity, and bravery of our election officials, uh, including uh, the two uh, secretaries of state here, including Secretary Sagaski in Nevada, or Megan Wolf in Wisconsin, or Tina Barton in Michigan. I mean, there's just so many uh, that stood up and fought for the integrity of the process. Uh, to get to your question, uh, it, it really is the, the perfect lead in. Uh, for three years, those of us at the Department of Homeland Security at, at CISA worked closely with the secretaries of state, state election directors, local election officials, to prepare for what we thought uh, and anticipated would be foreign interference in the election, whether that's in the form of uh, uh, targeting election systems, right, uh, trying to hack systems, or disinfo, or a hybrid of the two, right, claiming that they had access to things and spreading misinformation. And it turned out all of the uh, communications channels, all of the preparation, the amount of red teaming and uh, tabletop exercising that we did with the state and local election officials proved to be invaluable uh, in our experience at CISA in combating the domestic disinformation that we ended up seeing uh, around this election. Uh, the, the channels of communication we established where we had, for instance, an information sharing and analysis center that could reach 3,000 plus election officials in virtually real time with information about threats, risks, uh, narratives was coming about uh, proved to be critical for us, not just to secure the infrastructure, as Secretary Hobbs talked about, but to share information about what were the growing narratives uh, and to push uh, facts uh, about the process. So Russia had an ongoing, continues to have an ongoing campaign to undermine our democracy. That's not going away. In fact, uh, you know, it's more brazen in many ways because of what's happened in 2020 and the narratives that they can build off of uh, from this most recent election in the lies. Uh, we saw Iran uh, get involved in the lead up to the election, sending messages directly to voters, trying to discourage them from voting, purporting to be from the Proud Boys. Uh, and those are all things that we prepared for and talked about with state and local election officials. And, and as both Secretary Benson and Secretary Hobbs talked about, the establishment of election officials as that trusted source of information, that trusted Info 2020 campaign proved to be absolutely critical, not just in the lead up to the election, but afterwards to rebuff uh, the, the lies, uh, the misinformation that was being spread uh, about the election. And for those of us at the Department of Homeland Security, really our job uh, was to raise up those voices, to support those state and local election officials, regardless of where the misinformation was coming from, uh, and to push the facts. So for instance, uh, in the aftermath of the election, we established at CISA something called rumor control, uh, where we were really just publishing facts uh, about the elections process based on uh, emerging narratives that we saw. And the best example came from Secretary Hobbs State uh, with Sharpie Gate. Uh, mm -hmm. The claim that uh, Sharpies that were handed out in Maricopa County were intentionally being used to invalidate, uh, in this case, Republican ballots, uh, when in fact Sharpies were uh, 
the, the preferred uh, marking device uh, to, to ensure that votes were counted uh, had no impact on the result, but we saw that narrative take off uh, when uh, blue check marks picked up on it and started pushing that narrative. And so we put up on our rumor control the facts that your vote would be counted, that Sharpies are an appropriate marking instrument, and that in fact, the, the election officials across the country ensure uh, that those votes would be counted. And, and for us uh, at CISA, that was, that was our role, that was our job to support those election officials that for three years we had been grinding away to, to build security, to build resilience, but more importantly, not just do the work, but talk to voters about it. And election officials over and over and over again in the lead up to the election talked about how the, the process may be different, but the integrity of the process remains that the votes will be counted as cast and that you could have confidence in the results of the election. And, and uh, I'm really proud of the work we did together. It, it wasn't uh, necessarily the Russians or the Iranians in the end that, that we were uh, pushing back against, uh, but all that preparation and work uh, was critical uh, in, in being able to push back against the lies in this election. Oh, well, that's really interesting. So you were using the tactics that you had designed uh, for foreign interference uh, for domestic interference in a way. Um, we, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, yeah, cer certainly. I mean, the disinfo or misinfo, uh, you know, lies are lies, right? Uh, and so being able to push uh, and, and really pre-bunk uh, and the job that state and local election officials did, just messaging over and over again about how the process worked, what changes took place, uh, what steps they've put in place uh, to, to secure the election uh, were really critically important uh, in, in pushing back against uh, the narratives we saw emerge, whether regardless of where they were coming from, right? And so, uh, you know, it was that proactive work by the election officials, the, the constant uh, appearances and messaging to voters that proved to be really critical in the end. If if I can just jump, is it okay to yeah, jump? Yeah, go in ahead, there? Josh. Yeah, because um, I think I think it's a really important point Matt brought up, and and that was really important work. But I want to give you an example of what happened here in Pennsylvania, um, notwithstanding the good work that many of the folks who worked in the federal government were trying to do. We were facing just a tremendous amount of misinformation coming from the White House officially and from the president. Here's a concrete example. In Luzerne County, which is in the northeastern part of our state, um, before we could figure out what was really going on, um, the president, the former president's, I guess, I don't know, whatever she was called, the press secretary, communications director, um, you know, acting in her official capacity in the White House, complained about how a dozen or so ballots that were cast for Donald Trump were thrown away in Luzerne County. And immediately we were facing this firestorm of, of you know, what turned out to be misinformation, but where we were trying to get a handle on what it was that they could possibly be talking about. And they manipulated um, at the Department of Justice, the process of communicating with the public about what was going on there. Clearly his spokeswoman uh, manipulated what was happening. The, the blue checks as Matt talked about, you know, we're working overtime when, in fact, uh, when my office was able to get involved, talk to the local district attorney's office, talk to the local United States attorney's office. It turned out that we had, a, you know, basically an overzealous volunteer who accidentally tossed out a ballot when they thought they were tossing out the application. And they were immediately instructed by these good workers in the county to leave all of the information right there in the receptacle until law enforcement could come and determine what actually happened and make sure that no votes were ultimately thrown out, which is what occurred. And, and so that's the kind of misinformation that we were dealing with day in and day out, that we had to have units, not just of lawyers, but of communications professionals pushing back on that so that we could make sure people had faith in the process, faith in our institutions, whether it was in Luzerne County or uh, through the Secretary of State's office in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. And, you know, imagine going through that, not dealing with uh, foreign actors um, who wanted to try and undermine our system, but, you know, one of the key principals who was on the ballot uh, trying to, you know, push forth this misinformation in order to, to sow a narrative of doubt in order to you know, try and enhance his, his electoral standing. Yeah, I remember hearing about the, the 12 ballots in, in Pennsylvania. So, um, so in the midst of uh, um, this kind of swirl of 
misinformation and preparation that you all were, were doing, COVID hits. Um, and uh, I think it would, it would be interesting to hear um, what impact that that had. Did that uh, um, change your dates for ballots? Did it change your mail-in procedure? Um, uh, how, did, how did you handle COVID? Um, start with Secretary Benson, maybe? Yeah, and as I noted, uh, one year ago today, we had our presidential primary in Michigan. And one year ago uh, at 10 p.m. Eastern, about two hours after the polls closed, and we had a very successful election uh, with high turnout and all the rest, uh, the governor called and said she was about to announce the first two cases of COVID had come to Michigan. And from then on, everything changed. And notably, we had three subsequent elections scheduled in Michigan, local school board elections in May and about 10% of the state, a statewide primary in August, and then, of course, November. And so we had to make uh, two immediate decisions, uh, one, uh, really to adjust and adapt but two, to not postpone, Me knowing that everything we did was gonna set a precedent for how democracies reacted in times, of, in times like these, in times of crises. And so importantly, we, uh, I knew, I felt that if we postponed an election or canceled it, as many called on me to do for those May elections, uh, we would be creating a precedent that that's what you do in times of crisis. And I felt it was important at a time of great uncertainty when so many things were changing to be able to give voters the clarity and the certainty that their elections would proceed. And I did that not only with an intention of, of May and making sure we also used May as an opportunity to learn how to success, to pilot things. It was a local election. Let's, we made a decision to instead pilot uh, multiple ways of, of cast, of, of of sending out ballots and returning ballots and tabulating ballots in a way that would adjust to this new life under the pandemic. But also to give voters the confidence, it gets back to the misinformation. We were, um, thanks to the folks at CISA and the federal support, we were in con a constant state of preparing for an influx of misinformation to come to our state. And we anticipated the pandemic would just make that even more of a fertile ground. And so I didn't want November to come and have people put out misinformation that the election was gonna be canceled or postponed and for people to believe that because they had experienced it in previous you know, months. So that was really important. And then the second thing we did was just really double down on voter education, also in line with giving voters the confidence and certainty that they could vote without risking their health, providing PPE uh, for all of our election workers in the, and, and beginning to acquire the resources to do that early on for all three elections that we had, educating voters about how to vote from home, which thanks to the, 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 um, the voters' actions in 2018, where they amended our state constitution to give themselves a right to vote absentee or vote from home uh, without a reason. We just doubled down on our efforts to educate citizens about how to access that right because it was new. So I mailed every registered voter an application uh, on um, to, um, to vote on, with information on how to request their ballot to be mailed to them. Was that controversial to raise? <laughs> well, interestingly, at the time where we said, let's just mail everyone an application because others were doing that in other states, but also because the data showed that was the best way to educate someone about how to request to vote by mail or to vote absentee, we thought, well, what if they get this mailing and they don't know, they're not thinking about an election, they're not thinking about November. Uh, what if they don't really, it has, there's no context for it and it therefore just lands and doesn't really impact or educate. And thankfully, quote unquote, uh, the president at the time decided to tweet at me getting you know, lots of national fervor about sending out these applications. And that actually worked to educate voters about their ability to vote absentee <laughs> because it came with a lot of more misinformation that we then countered. But notably, uh, more people voted absentee in our November election than ever before, 3.3 million of the 5.5 million who voted. And we have those, those who amplified that option through various means to thank for making sure voters knew how to vote from home safely. And also that if they chose to vote in person, because they had that option, that they'd be met with PPE, clerks and election workers and with PPE to protect their health and safety if they voted in person. So we basically, you know, also in, in near constant conversation with other secretaries around the country, we have weekly calls with the other secretaries, sharing best practices, sharing what we were learning as we were managing the elections, really 
put us all in a position to have a successful election in November because we used every day, every month, every election uh, as an opportunity to prepare and learn and really perfect for the lack, if you can say even that, it's like, you know, really um, uh, put us in the best position possible to succeed in November uh, with all that we learned and, and really focused along the way. So the former president gave you a hand. Well, uh, yeah, I don't. <laughs> I, I, all I can say is that um, it, you know, was not without its challenges. I certainly didn't welcome that attention or that um, those threats that that really just escalated throughout the year in a way that was which was you know not enjoyable. But um, but I try to always see the bright side, and so notably, it did amplify this right that citizens had in Michigan to vote by mail and vote absentee. And really, um, I think was part of what led so many people to ultimately decide to do so throughout the year. Yeah, yeah. Katie, how about Arizona? Uh, Arizona's had vote by mail for many years, but did did, did you make any changes in, in light of COVID? Um, well, our top priority, the top priority of my administration has always been to increase voters' ability to participate in democracy. And so that didn't change with COVID. It became more pressing. Um, because on top of, of, of ensuring that we were uh, expanding that access, um, we wanted to make sure that voters didn't have to choose between that participation and their health and safety. Um, and so vote by mail was a, was a key component of, of what we did um, in terms of the, the election and the pandemic and voter safety. So, so we've had no excuse absentee voting in Arizona since the early 90s. Um, and voters in Arizona can either um, request a one-time early ballot for whichever election they prefer, or they can sign up for our permanent early voter list. And about 75% of registered voters of both parties uh, are on that permanent early voter list. So they're sent a ballot by mail for every election that they're eligible to vote in. And so we asked the legislature early on while they were still in session to give us permission to um, to basically implement universal vote by mail for the November for the August primary and November elections, and the legislature wouldn't even entertain that conversation. Uh, but what we did was ensure that every single voter who wasn't already signed up for the, the permanent early voter list received communication either through our office or their county elections office, um, getting that application to either sign up for the Pebble, the permanent early voter list or request their um, early ballot for the August and November elections. And so every voter was getting that information. Um, so as an option to, uh, to vote uh, by mail and vote safely. Um, but we also coupled that with looking at other ways that we could expand early voting opportunities in our state, along with um, voting by mail. We also have early voting that starts 27 days before the election. Um, and there's a lot of areas of Arizona that are very underserved by the Postal Service. And so we knew that making early voting more accessible in those areas was going to be really critical in order to not disenfranchise voters in those communities. And so we expanded the, the, early, the secure early ballot drop-off options. Um, per, I think we purchased about 84 new boxes for the state. So that was on top of what counties already had in place. Um, and... Um, and, and then, as Secretary Benson mentioned, of course, we work to secure all of the necessary protective supplies for voters and poll workers. Um, and, and Secretary Benson also talked about, you know, learning the lessons from the one election and applying it to the subsequent elections. So by the time we got to November, I think we were experts at um, election, uh, conducting elections during a pandemic. We also had our presidential preference election almost a year ago. It was um, the 17th, so a week from, from now, a year ago, um, and had three elections in, um, in 2020. And I would say that um, the work that we did um, with all of those preparations and, um, and ensuring that voters could vote safely uh, was successful, evidenced by the, the record turnout in all three of those elections. Um, and, and none of those preparations would have mattered if we weren't able to continue to educate the public about what we were doing and how they could participate safely um, and just continue to push back against the misinformation. Because as I said earlier, the, the pandemic really served to amplify 
the amount of misinformation that we were having to deal with. Yeah, yeah. Um, Josh, what was going on in Pennsylvania? And I, and I have a particular question now, uh, wearing your attorney general hat, um, uh, there is a, a, a legal dispute as to whether anybody other than the legislature can make changes uh, to uh, election procedures um, and the conduct of elections. And uh, e even in the circumstances that we had last year with the, with the pandemic, um, uh, Am I wrong? Did, did Pennsylvania have a, a lawsuit that raised that issue? Yeah. And I'll, I'll give you a little bit of background on that. That's, that's a great question. So, so first, I mean, the, the underlying issue of COVID is directly related to the question you just raised. Um, actually, just stepping a half a step back, in 2019, prior to COVID, our state legislature, with, with more Republican votes than Democratic votes, passed Act 77, our vote by mail statute. And so it allowed uh, people to cast their ballots from home or wherever through, through the mail. Fast forward a few months later, uh, COVID hits. Our um, primary, which would normally have been in April, was pushed back until June. Many people voted safely and securely by mail. Following that, um, we faced a, a couple more challenges. What happened was um, we got notification from the United States Postal Service that they would not necessarily be able to deliver election mail on time within the, the framework that was required. Upon hearing that, um, there was a, a, a legal action taken by the governor appealing to our United, pardon me, to our state Supreme Court, asking to make sure that ballots that were post legal ballots that were postmarked by election day could be counted so long as they were received by the Friday after election day. And the Pennsylvania State Supreme Court, relying on state law and relying and, and dealing with the reality that the U.S. Postal Service had laid out for us, indicated that those ballots could be received and could be counted so long as they were postmarked by election day. That's the subject of um, some litigation that went up to the United States Supreme Court, uh, where the justices refused to step in and overturn the, the state Supreme Court on multiple occasions. But it turned into a talking point for Donald Trump and his enablers, back to the point Matt was making before about um, you know, the, the disinformation and the lies campaign. And so they were able to spin that as a tale, suggesting that somehow uh, this was going to be the, the reason why the election should be overturned. From a pure mathematical perspective, there were more than 7 million votes cast. Joe Biden won the election here in Pennsylvania by over 80,000 votes. And that batch of ballots that was postmarked by election day and received, you know, up to that Friday after during that three day window, during yeah. that three day window was less than 10,000 votes. Um, so even if all of those votes happened to be for uh, former President Trump, it would not have altered uh, the outcome of the election. So that's what that, you know, that sort of manufactured controversy is all about. Um, now, the legislature is obviously now relooking at all of our election laws. I would argue they're looking at it to make it harder for people to vote. But certainly, if they want to look at this issue um, and address it legislatively, they certainly can. But our state Supreme Court ruled. The United States Supreme Court refused to step in. Um, those ballots were legal, but ultimately, they were not material in terms of the overall vote total or vote difference between Donald Trump and, and Joe Biden. Yeah, yeah. Um, we've been uh, talking a bit about the amount of disinformation that was floating around, but um, uh, I think it's fair to say that uh, emotion, emotions were running higher and higher as we got to the election and in the immediate aftermath of the uh, election. Um, uh, what, what was that like? Uh, were... Um, uh, any of you um, uh, ever the subject of um, uh, potential violence or threat of violence? Um, uh, 
Jocelyn, I think uh, they, I think they came to your house, didn't they? Yeah, I remember. And it was actually Secretary Hobbs, I remember, was the first that I recall making a statement um, about that, about the uh, the threats. And it was really something that we all experience in varying ways. But of course, in Michigan, it really began in the spring when we had armed uh, protesters descend on our state capitol building uh, with, you know, machine guns and, and the like and AK-47s, you know, in, in the chamber, in the legislative chamber. Uh, so we'd been in this heightened state of intense um, threats. And of course, you know, in October, um, though there had been May, there had been death threats made against the attorney general, myself, the governor, the legislators. Uh, it really culminated in the kidnapping plot that was that emerged in October. So it was almost this 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 odd normal in our state of of um, despite our all of our calls to um, the, the the then president to really dampen down and really lead and in, in trying to to turn down the heat. It kept getting turned up as we got closer and closer to November. Uh, and and then you know two things happened after the polls closed. One. It became very clear. I was, I was very. Our estimates was that we'd have the election results by Friday. That was just what math told us. If you had 3.3 million absentee ballots and you have this many machines, it'll take 80 hours uh, to, to tabulate them. We were able to increase machines and people so that we could cut that time in half and have our results in 24 hours after the polls closed on Wednesday. But notably, I think there had been plans in place for violence. People showed up at outside the place where the ballots were being tabulated in Detroit. They showed up in Philly, they showed up in Phoenix as well. But we were done by that point. They just didn't, hadn't realized it yet. We had already, we had, we had created some shifts and other things to make sure that the tabulation was done uh, earlier than planned and earlier than announced to essentially curtail any efforts to use Thursday or Friday to try to um, interfere with the process. So that violence really um, was something that we had anticipated that we had the threats, I should say, of violence that occurred in Detroit um, that we had really kind of tempered a little bit. Um, but of course, then it then manifested in various other ways, including people showing up outside my home one Saturday night in December. And that was particularly challenging because uh, it took uh, state police 40 minutes to show up, even though they knew at 8 p.m. Uh, that people were going to show up at my house at 9 p.m. and they had intelligence warning us that. They still didn't show up until closer to 10, um, despite our calls. And it was really the attorney general who I was, who was most helpful at, in, in helping us get through that, that evening, as well as the mayor of Detroit and the chief of police in Detroit. Um, but it was really unnerving until um, I realized that these folks outside my home, these folks outside TCF Center in Detroit, they weren't protesting me. They weren't, they, they were protesting democracy. They were protesting the results of an election they disagreed with. And so immediately I, especially in that moment in December was, was emboldened to stand proudly in guard of our democracy, even if that meant increased attacks towards me as a person, because again, it was, it was the people, the millions of people who voted in our state that I had to essentially protect against those angry individuals. Uh, and, um, and so that kind of gave me a sense of fortitude to get through it. But of course that didn't stop the escalation of the threats all the way up until what we saw happen in our capital on January 6th. Uh, and I think the bottom line for me in all of that is that this can't become everything that happened after the election in particular, all those shenanigans, so I can sort of call them lots of things, but that's a lot of what it was. It can't become the norm in our democracy. We have to, on both sides of the aisle, define what happened is wrong, hold those accountable who led those bad actions to fruition and really ensure that regardless of who wins an election, that we can all come together and, and respect the will of the voters in the future. Yeah, yeah, and peaceful transfer of power, no doubt. Um, uh, you know, uh, Katie, what was going on in, in Arizona? Well, a lot of the same things that Secretary Benson mentioned, we had armed protesters show up at the tabulation center in Maricopa County. Um, and for a while they were, you know, in the parking lot um, between the door and how staff members got to and from their vehicles. And because it was right after an election and we were tabulating ballots and um, there were pretty much staff working there 24 hours. Um, so it was very disconcerting. 
Um, we had national figures who were there um, inciting the crowd, very potentially inciting violence. And then when the tabulation wrapped up, they decided to you know, show up at my house and do the same thing at my house. Um, so again, very disconcerting, but I think Jocelyn really articulated um, something that's been, you know, a really difficult piece of all of this is that these attacks on officials, and it's not just those of us in high profile positions, but it is all the way down to all the election staff, the poll workers, the people that work in the offices. Um, and it is, I think, a sad state of affairs where we live in a world that we have to be concerned about all of their safety. But what that is really about is the safety of our democracy. And, um, and I have always known that I stood on the right side of what everything that happened in the election, that we did everything by the book and there, there, I have no concerns about the conduct of the election. Um, and that is also what emboldens me um, that, that we did everything right and that it is our job to stand up for the truth of what we did. So while it has been very disconcerting, I have not let it um, deter me from what I, I, the job that the people of Arizona elected me to do. Yeah, for sure. For sure. You know, after the election, we um, uh, learned all about how ballots are certified uh, and the count is uh, certified and the electors are actually uh, um, chosen. Um, uh, I was just wondering uh, whether um, uh, any of you think there's a, a, a better or more streamlined way uh, to, to get to finality um, there uh, so that there aren't all of these opportunities to um, you know, intervene, so to speak. Yeah. I'll jump in on that. You know, I've, I've served as an elector now three times. Um, twice for Barack Obama and now once for Joe Biden. And um, I've even been in uh, the U.S. Capitol for the what used to be sort of the, the somewhat quaint and, and an interesting process of certifying the electors, in this case on January the 6th. And, you know, one of the reasons why the system has worked in the past is because um, people of both parties have respected the norms in our constitution. Uh, and no longer is that the case. Uh, in this last cycle, it was Donald Trump, and who knows who it could be in the future. And who knows whether um, these problems will only attach to one party. I'd like to think that um, the party that I'm proud to be associated with, the Democratic Party, wouldn't engage with that. But what we have seen is that um, those norms uh, are violated and are willing to be violated, and that the oath of office people take to the constitution is clearly not something that they uh, are willing to honor when their job is on the line or when their buddy's job is on the line. And so I came to the conclusion, notwithstanding that long history I've had of being an elector and participating in this process, that um, we can no longer trust those processes that I think people sort of thought were quaint in the past. Um, first off, they're a relic of an age where um, at least you know, three of us on this call vote wouldn't even count in the first place. Um, it's a relic of an age where the system was set up and designed to work for certain people and, and not to really include the voices of others. And so um, I came out very forcefully, uh, even after serving as an elector in this process, with abolishing the electoral college. And I recognize that is going to take uh, time and it's not a realistic thing that would be in place uh, in the short term, but I think it speaks to the broader issues, which gets to the heart of your question, which is we have to have um, a direct, you know, popular vote based on the certification by these secretaries of state in the various states and say, that's the finale. That's the end of it. When Michigan says this is what the vote is and the secretary of state uh, and or the governor, depending upon the, the rules that state certified, that's it. And we shouldn't have all of these other steps where you can um, have abuse. I'd like to think that going forward, we won't have actors that will abuse the process, but it's clear that uh, in this case we did. Uh, and it's also clear that the guardrails just simply don't exist 
to prevent that from happening again in the future. Yeah, yeah. Jocelyn or Katie, you want to hop in on that? Well, I, I would just say, uh, I do agree with Attorney General uh, on abolishing the Electoral College, but I also want to say that our, our democracy withstood the challenges. Um, so while I have concerns um, about the opportunities that there were for attack at the various steps along the way, we are strong and we withstood those challenges. Um, so um, I, and I think we learned a lot of lessons that will prepare us in the future of should we face these challenges again, we, we know what to do in the face of them. Yeah. Secretary Napolitano, uh, can yeah. I just briefly, I mean, I, <clears throat> really uh, interesting points raised, but I, I think we have to deal with the fact that you have to get to certification by the states first, right? And, and you raised the time aspect, Secretary, which is totally fair, uh, but but dealing with the facts, and, and this is probably always going to be the case, but viewing this as a horse race rather than, than getting to the end of the process drives that, that urgency and, and um, uh, what, anxiety about it, instead of understanding and, and opening up the process to understand that the, those ballots, the count didn't uh, wasn't delayed, for instance. The counts in these states weren't delayed. They were going through the process to ensure that every valid vote was counted and counted correctly, right? And so understanding that as we look at the process as a whole, that states have a job to do in certifying the election that includes the necessary controls and checks to ensure the integrity, the access, and the security of the process that's needed to get to that certification before we ever get to an electoral college or anything like that. And, and how much detail goes into it. If you look at Michigan and what Secretary Benson and, and the uh, local officials, over a thousand local officials in, in Michigan do, they, they check the township tape, then go up to the county and check the, the totals to the county, then check the totals all the way up uh, to the state. And so I think what we need to do as, as a profession, as election officials are now put in the position to have to rebuild trust, unfairly put in that position by the lies, we have to begin to look at what can we do to build greater transparency and, and open up the process so that folks can see all of the controls that are in place. And, and I give a lot of credit. I, I had the pleasure of serving on Secretary Benson's security committee that, that looked at this. It can't just be a post-election audit like we saw in Georgia. It, it needs to be full opening of chain of custody and understanding uh, ballot processing and registration records and, and how we maintain lists so that voters don't have to take anyone's word for it, but in fact can see the evidence, have the evidence uh, to have confidence in the process. And, and that means more resourcing uh, for election officials. Uh, it, it is untenable to ask them to go quickly to do it effectively, efficiently, and accurately and do it transparently without supporting them, investing in the infrastructure uh, in a way that allows them uh, to do that. And, and they'll embrace that role. Election officials have long said, it's our job to convince the loser they lost. I, I think that's changed now. It's now the job to convince uh, the voters of the accurate result, even if the loser doesn't accept that they lost. And, and that's a higher bar and a greater challenge that we need to accept, embrace, and invest in. Right, so we've got some audience questions and, and uh, uh, one is uh, pivots right off of uh, your, your comment, Matt, which is um, uh, uh, even given all of these checks in the systems and the accuracy and the confidence you had in the integrity of, of the count, um, uh, a, a significant percentage of the population um, don't believe it. Uh, they, 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 they think former President Trump uh, won the election. What ideas do you have for uh, how we um, build trust um, and uh, not have this, this kind of a situation, which is really counter to our democracy? Yeah, I'll go first, just, just very briefly, and then uh, open it up. But uh, it, it's got it. So the advantage, one of the large advantages we have is the fact that uh, we run elections at the state and local level. Uh, and I, I think that's a real asset in this case, because voters 
can engage directly in the process, engage directly with those who run the process in order to understand, to have their questions answered, to gain transparency. Uh, the reality is in all of these states represented here in all the states, uh, there are opportunities for voters to get directly engaged. Obviously, the most productive way would be as a poll worker, uh, but there's a number as, as poll watchers uh, and, and uh, pre-election testing is public, all of these things. Uh, and then as election officials, uh, finding new and creative ways, which I think election officials did during COVID, uh, to open the process up so that voters can see exactly how each step is done, how those reconciliations, the amount of detail and minutia that goes in. Election officials are detail-oriented uh, professionals uh, that have these controls. And so uh, whether it's a post-election audit and opening that up or, or offering the types of evidence around chain of custody, ballot storage, ballot custody, uh, it, it, we have to continue to engage with voters. And it's, it's going to be uh, a slog. And unfortunately, election officials uh, have unfairly been put in that position to have to begin to do that. Uh, and, and it's, it, it's going to take uh, real time investment uh, and sort of just being the water, just constantly providing that steady stream of information and evidence. But the other part of this that, that I, I think several have brought up that's critical, there has to be accountability for the lies. The reality is if that those were, who were pushing the lies uh, would just stand up and say this election was fair, it was accurate, it had integrity, that would go an incredibly long way. But, but I don't think any of us anticipate that happening. And so we've got to deal with the reality that we have now. Well, I think I'll add two things on that. One, I agree on the accountability point. Um, and I'll, I'll talk about that in a second. But first, the, the issue actually is really quite heartbreaking. You have citizens who were lied to by people they trust, elected officials they supported, that they voted for, then turn around and lied to their supporters about their votes and the process in a way to further their own political agenda and, um, and their own partisan gains and sort of their own egos. So I think you know citizens uh, the, have the facts and the evidence that secretaries like myself and Secretary Hobbs and others have worked to provide. And as the court cases actually did demonstrate, as the Attorney General, as Attorney General Shapiro can can underscore. And so the evidence is there uh, to withstand any amount of scrutiny. The truth is is uh, available for anyone who chooses to see it. Uh, but I think first recognizing, I think citizens need to recognize that they, these folks, these leaders lied to them about the election. It was actually the most secure and accurate and, uh, and highly participated in election that we've seen in recent history. And that gets to the second point of accountability, because what we really need is for leaders to stop lying to their citizens, to voters, about the truth of the elections. And the only way we get there is by adding, you know, making sure that they don't, they not only don't benefit by those, by perpetuating those lies, but there actually is some accountability there. And so in, in, in Michigan, we proposed an Anti-Deceptive Practices Act, actually criminalizing the intentional spreading of misinformation and lies with the intent, and so the knowing uh, spreading of that information with the intent to disenfranchise someone. Uh, to uh, And there's multiple ways you can narrowly tailor it so that it withstands any strict scrutiny under the constitution and doesn't infringe on- right. You've got a first amendment issue, yeah. Right. But, uh, but we have to, uh, I think, really dig deep and look into how to protect our voters just the way that we protect customers against false advertising. Uh, we can protect voters against those who would seek to lie to them about their rights intentionally so. Uh, and that's the type of legislation that we've proposed and we hope other states do as well. I wanna pick up on Jocelyn's point and, and Matt's and come back to something Katie said a few minutes ago. Um, I agree with the, the points that, that were made by Jocelyn and the type of legislation that needs to be uh, put forth and hopefully adopted. I also think it's critically important through our political process that the next nominees for Republicans, forget president, but the elections that are going to come up in a couple of years for Senate and governor and secretaries of state and all these other offices, that the Republicans who are nominated aren't rewarded for perpetuating the lies. I think that there is a political component to this as well that, that really needs to, um, that needs to still play out. But I, I want to come back to something Katie said, which you know, I, I tend to be a glass half full guy, but I, I feel a little uh, glass half empty. I listened to Katie talk about how our democracy held, which, which it did if you sort of look at the bottom line, which is on January 20th, Donald Trump walked out and Joe Biden walked in, right? But there was just 
such an extraordinary amount of damage that was done to our democracy. And furthermore, I fundamentally believe, and this is one of the, the catalysts for me that led to me reaching the conclusion that we have to abolish the electoral college. I fundamentally believe that if Kevin McCarthy were the speaker and Nancy Pelosi was not, and you combine that with Mitch McConnell at the time, who was the majority uh, leader, Senate majority leader, um, I have no doubt in my mind that they would have attempted to steal the election and not certify the votes from places like Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, Michigan, and, and Arizona, and try and hand the presidency to Donald Trump. And I don't know if they would have been successful, but I sure as hell know they would have tried, given the fact that there were no guardrails for them anymore, that they were complete sycophants who were spineless when it came to Donald Trump. And so, but for the fact that Nancy Pelosi was the speaker and had a majority and thus was able to, to run the floor and, and you know, control the, the, the votes and the apparatus there in the House, um, this could have been a very, very different outcome. I do not believe that there was enough control within the Republican caucus in the House or the Senate uh, of the United States to prevent uh, the type of stealing that, that I know they wanted to do, that guys like Hawley and Cruz and others uh, attempted to do. And so I think we have to come to grips with that reality. Um, mm -hmm. We have to educate uh, in our schools and through our politics. We have to you know, carefully nominate certain people, and we have to make the kind of structural changes that Jocelyn and others were talking about uh, a moment ago. You know, uh, yeah, well said. And Josh, um, after uh, the election, there was, uh, you know, so much litigation. But uh, w one case that caught my attention was the case filed by the Attorney General of Texas. Uh, yeah. And he uh, had, I don't know, uh, how, how many Republican attorneys general on, on, on the case, they wanted to throw out your ballots and Jocelyn, your ballots. And, um, uh, and uh, uh, can you explain to me what possible issue they had and, yeah. um, uh, and the role of the state attorneys generals? I, I was a state attorney general uh, 1999 to 2003. So it's a while ago. Um, and there's a, an association called the National Association of Attorneys General, right. NAG, not a great acronym, but not a great name. Yeah. No. Um, but while I was attorney general, and when I, while I was attorney general, when I started, the idea was that attorneys general were somewhat politically neutral. Um, uh, we were law enforcement officers and uh, um, prosecutors, um, uh, but we weren't particularly partisan. During my term, uh, uh, the Republican AGs broke off into what has now become RAGA. And then a few years later, the Democrats had to do the same thing, and we had uh, DAGA. So it kind of fundamentally changed the job of being an attorney general. Uh, uh, and so um, I, I, I was sad to see, but not surprised to see that uh, with, with the lead of the AG from Texas, that the Republican AGs from across the country were trying to throw out other state ballots. What do you, can you explain what their theory was? Well, I can't explain their theory, but I can explain what happened. Um, I don't, I don't think they had a, a particularly honest theory. Look, this, um, this was one of the saddest days uh, of my time as, as the attorney general of Pennsylvania, uh, a job I'm just honored to, to hold when that lawsuit was filed. And in a nutshell, what the Texas attorney general was saying was that the United States Supreme Court should step in and invalidate the votes here in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania because he didn't agree with the choice that our citizens made. That was effectively what he was saying. And you know, I'll tell you, uh, Secretary Napolitano, we, we reviewed their lawsuit over and over and over again to try to understand what the legal rationale was for what they were doing. Uh, and ultimately, we concluded there was none. You know, sometimes you're, you're on opposite sides of someone in a lawsuit, you know this, and you really disagree with them, but you, you understand their perspective and you understand the argument they're trying to make. And, 
you, you battle back and ideally, you know, you win. In this case, um, I just kept going back and forth with my team saying uh, that I really thought this was an act of sedition, that they were really trying to undermine our representative democracy and, and end it as we know it. Because if they were successful, take it to its logical conclusion, any state could invalidate the votes in any other state just because they didn't agree with their political choice. Um, I was sad that, uh, that they did this because, frankly, I worked in a really bipartisan manner with my colleagues, uh, especially on the opioid litigation and so many other things that, that we've been dealing with over the last number of years. But I was especially sad when 17 of my uh, colleagues signed on to that lawsuit demonstrating their lack of respect for the rule of law. And I've spoken to them privately about that and uh, been very direct uh, and pointed with them in terms of how I feel. The idea that they would go through with that um, was very sad. I'll tell you, I was a little bit concerned given the makeup of the new United States Supreme Court that somehow they might entertain it. But I just kept saying to myself, there's just no legal rationale for this. They can't possibly take this up. Uh, and at the end of the day, notwithstanding the, the new look of the U.S. Supreme Court, they still adhered to the rule of law and they threw the Texas suit out fairly quickly. I, I will just tell you from an, kind of an insider perspective, it's really poisoned the well amongst the attorneys general. Um, it's very, very hard to work with a colleague that believes that the residents of your state don't count and that they somehow know better than in my case, the 7 million Pennsylvanians who cast votes, some for Donald Trump and some for, for Joe Biden. Uh, and I thought it was um, seditious. I thought it was, um, it was unethical what they did. Uh, and I think they, they simply are not fit to serve as attorneys general anymore, given uh, the role that they play in trying to undermine our democracy. Yeah, yeah. Um, it may also have been uh, the way I looked at it is uh, it, it was more for the press attention than the than the legal validity. Um, just yeah, bit. but there's even in those cases. I mean, we we all recognize the the power of the media to amplify our point of view, but I think we all recognize. I mean, there's certain lines you don't cross, and uh, one of those basic lines you don't cross is you don't violate the oath you take to the Constitution. And in this case, the Texas Attorney General did and encouraged others to join him. Um, he is absolutely unfit to serve uh, and, and certainly violated his oath in an attempt to, to merely suck up to a corrupt president. Yeah, yeah. Oh, um, well, thanks for that. And while we're talking law, Katie, uh, we've got a question from uh, the audience. Um, if the Supreme Court upholds the Arizona voting statute at issue in Brnovich versus DNC, how will that affect future elections? Um, are there ways of improving voter access even if those statutes are upheld? Um, that is a great question. And um, let me tell you my concern about this case is not necessarily the impact on these laws in Arizona. These are this, this lawsuit is old, it, it was brought in 2016. So these are laws that have been on the books in Arizona. Um, I would like to see them go away um, and would be happy with a ruling that did that. I'm, I'm not um, hopeful that that is going to happen, but what is more concerning, uh, and for those, uh, just a little more background, um, the, the oral arguments, it's, it's DNC versus Brnovich, um, and the oral arguments were uh, last Tuesday in front of the Supreme Court. Um, but in, in the context of all of the, this voter, um, the, the legislation we're seeing across the country in unprecedented numbers, Arizona leading the way in that, um, that would restrict voter access and, and, and roll back voting rights, um, that the arguments that were made to try to convince the Supreme Court to weaken Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act will impact um, across the country, people's ability to bring court challenges in the future on discriminatory vote voting laws. Um, and that is to me what's more concerning um, a, a, about the, the court case um, because that impact obviously is far beyond Arizona. 
Now, I think that the court could decide to rule narrowly and just uphold the Arizona laws and not tackle the attacks on the Voting Rights Act. Um, but I have, I, I am, un, I don't know what they will do, and so that should be concerning to everyone uh, in terms of future ability to use the courts to challenge discriminatory voting laws because we are seeing um, them being proposed in unprecedented numbers right now. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, we'll find out when the when the court uh, hands down it's an opinion. Um, here's another question. This is for you, Jocelyn. Uh, in Michigan, were any devices in Antrim County hardwired to the internet or otherwise connected to the internet? No, and, and we've actually done a entire, um, and what happened in Antrim County in Michigan was actually the result of a clerk not updating the software actually uh, for this particular um, technology. Uh, but you know, knowing that it was then utilized uh, to spread this sort of false information and call into question the results of the entire election, not just in Michigan, but nationwide, uh, we, um, we actually did a full audit uh, of, the, of every ballot, every paper ballot, and, and our citizens vote on paper ballots uh, in, um, in Michigan, just like the majority of citizens in the country. And so what that then enables is for an audit to happen of the paper ballots to affirm that they were accurately tabulated by the voting machines. And indeed, that's exactly what the audit showed. Uh, and it, it's interesting, I think, once the, all is said and done, that, that sort of case study emerging out of Antrim County will be very illustrative of just how much bad actors can try to leverage uh, different um, pieces of misinformation to really uh, create an entire conspiracy theory about um, an entire election. Uh, but we simply just responded to all of that uh, with, the, again, the truth. Uh, and that's, again, why a verified paper ballots, which we have in Michigan, which most states have, are, are so important to protect uh, because as, as CISA's former leader, Chris Krebs, and many others says you can't hack paper. Uh, and through those paper ballots, we're able to verify the results, uh, the accurate results of the Antrim County elections. But again, uh, it was, and I'm sure Matt may have additional things you may want to add on, on this whole saga, uh, but it was really illustrative of how um, really innocent um, administrative errors can be um, falsely and wrongly extrapolated and used in a way that just furthers and feeds uh, false information and conspiracy theories and really is wrongly used to undermine people's faith in the process. Right. Matt, you want to add anything there? Yeah, no, Secretary Benson uh, is exactly right. And it, it's sort of uh, fascinating slash depressing to to look at sort of how these conspiracies spread. Uh, the, the, the one uh, related to Dominion voting systems was really the combination of three or four conspiracies that quite frankly, in my experience uh, being in elections since 2005, have sort of been around the fringes for a while. Uh, this idea between, behind Hugo Chavez and, and Venezuela being a, involved in voting systems. They, that, that's been around since 2005, 2006. The, the uh, theories around uh, CITEL and results reporting in uh, Barcelona uh, and the relationship between uh, President Obama and, and, and that company and, and George Soros has been around since 2008, 2010, all completely false, all completely wrong, all not based in fact. But what we saw in this election was incidents like Secretary Benson described in Antrim County, uh, incidents in, in uh, Georgia that happen in every election, by the way, uh, where humans are involved and, and mistakes are made and quickly rectified. Antrim County quickly rectified once identified to them what, what the issue was, had the auditable records right there, uh, could correct the answer. But we saw this combination into this broader conspiracy that included, at times, the CIA, included DHS uh, putting uh, uh, isotopic uh, watermarks on ballots to be able to track them to look for the fraud. Uh, and, and to me, perhaps the most disturbing part is uh, these took hold and spread very, very quickly, as the attorney general talked about. Uh, and, and despite the best efforts of all the election officials, uh, the loudest voices, uh, a recent report, I know I'm not supposed to uh, push a report from Stanford on a Cal broadcast, but a recent report from the Election Information Project, which includes Stanford, Washington, uh, Graphica, some other partners, shows that, that really 20 to 25 uh, major influencers just jumped on this misinformation, pushed it broadly, and, and uh, the result was 
uh, you know, uh, death threats, uh, threats to election officials, and, and then eventually January 6th. Uh, and, and to me, uh, the, the loss of a transfer, uh, a peaceful transfer of power. And, and that's a loss of, of the very core of who we are as Americans. And we, we're, we're now going to have to come to grips uh, with the fact that, that uh, we, we didn't have a peaceful transfer of power. And what does that mean for us moving forward uh, to begin to deal with that? All based on just insane theories uh, that that were you know every good piece of disinfo or effective starts with a little nugget of fact. Did Antrim County have a problem? Yes, Antrim County had a problem, but none of the rest of the facts around that were correct. We had the paper ballots. I mean, the the easiest example I can give you: five million plus ballots in Georgia have been counted, then hand recounted by hand without any machines, and then recounted again, all coming to the same result, and we still. Uh, have people saying that that the result in Georgia was incorrect. And, and we've got to come to grips with that uh, and begin to really ask ourselves some challenging questions, both about our, our uh, information ecosystem, our election ecosystem, and, and what evidence we can continue to provide and how to hold uh, people accountable. And I'll just what chuck a, a little grenade in the middle uh, where the previous conversation about uh, the courts, we, we've got to come to terms with the fact that the courts were used for disinfo as well, uh, and, and the way that the courts were used, uh, and how we can begin to respond uh, and, and recognize the use of the courts in that way as well. Yeah, Josh, do you agree with that? You think the courts were used as a disinformation uh, device? I think the, the courts were used by uh, attorneys who were willing to act in an unethical manner uh, as a way to spread their disinformation. I'm pleased to see, uh, you know, Jocelyn's colleague in Michigan and, and my good friend and colleague, Dana Nessel, um, you know, seek sanctions against some of the, the attorneys who were involved in those cases. And we're certainly looking at that as well in, in Pennsylvania. Uh, the, the good news that, at least from our perspective, is both the state and the federal courts, all the way up to the U.S. Supreme Court and our state Supreme Court, did hold. I mean, they they saw through that misinformation um, and they sided with the truth. But we have got to we can't let that become a norm where the courts uh, are used as a way to spread this misinformation, the way actors like Giuliani and, you know, some of those, you know, the other nutballs that were associated with him uh, did, you know, when it came to the, uh, you know, the, the federal and state courts. Yeah. Yeah, um, uh, it, it was amazing to watch. As as a as a, as a lawyer, uh, I, I must say it was almost it was it was embarrassing actually um, uh, to to see fellow members of the bar um, um, uh, do that. Um, and I, I have, by the way, I think I think there's serious questions not just about those lawyers who were acting on behalf of the president, but some of the attorneys general. We talked about this before when it came to the AG of Texas, but. You know, at, at what point does you know the the you know sort of the line that that the AGs are on? They probably have a little bit more latitude than a, a private attorney. But at what point do they go too far, and can they be sanctioned or or disbarred? And I know that there are some in Texas seeking to disbar General Paxton. I would encourage them to continue to move forward with that process. But you know, that's another issue. These these government actors, including some who were working at DOJ. And trying to work directly with the president, former president, uh, to overturn the election. At, at what point, you know, are they held accountable as well? It's not just the private attorneys; some of the government attorneys as well. Sorry to interrupt you. Yeah, no, no, good, really good point. Um, uh, and I'm going back to an audience question. It's somewhat related. Um, uh, uh, one of the panelists on our first panel this uh, morning uh, uh, brought up the. Um, the that in other countries, um, uh, those who are responsible for conducting the election are not themselves partisans. Um, uh, they're, uh, I gather, civil servant uh, types. Uh, and if, if we had that sort of system in the United States, do you think it would increase the perception of fairness of our election system? Well, I think um, two things. One, and I wrote a whole book on this where I really you know, looked at the, the secretaries of state as guardians of the democratic process, local election administrators as well, and also whether someone should be appointed or elected. 
uh, and in Pennsylvania, you have an appointment of Secretary of State in Arizona and in many other states like Michigan, you have an election, uh, a partisan one nonetheless, at the local level uh, clerks are elected in Michigan to administer elections. And really what I think a lot of the research and what my experience has really underscored is just, it's just all about the person. And yeah, we exist in a political ecosystem where there are pressures, uh, but at the same time, I know for myself as an attorney and as really someone who's been a voting rights and election law attorney throughout my entire career, um, my allegiance is to the Constitution uh, and to the voters, and that's why I ran for this office. And, and I think uh, I intentionally, um, you know, I don't endorse uh, candidates in any election. Uh, I don't even endorse uh, appointed people seeking appointments because they're asking elected officials to appoint them. And that also cre just creates a potential conflict. Uh, and I, I think when voters uh, demand that um, elected secretaries of state or election administrators in particular act in a non partial, impartial manner, um, when they elect those who seek to do so and, uh, and don't elect those who use their office to, to put their thumb on the scale, and there are some that do. Uh, then we'll see, uh, you know, we'll be in the best position possible. But I, I don't think the infrastructure itself, there's no infrastructure that really um, can lead to um, a place where you have nonpartisan election administrators. You just simply have to put them in place and elect them. Now, I do think, and I have talked to folks about having a code of ethics for election administrators, secretaries of state, much like we have a code of ethics for judges that they must abide by or perhaps lose their ability to perform that job. I think it is important that those administering elections do so as referees, not as members of a particular team that's on the ballot. Uh, but again, it all gets back to voters selecting and electing good people in those positions and advocating and supporting them. And those good people can be Democrat or Republican. They simply have to be beholden to voters first, country above party. Yeah, well said, well said. Anybody else wanna um, chime in on that? Yeah, just, just real quick, uh, just to, to drive home, I, I agree. And my experience uh, at the state and local level working in election administration is as soon as you become an election administrator, uh, you stop caring about the results and you, you just care about the integrity of the process. And that's just not that local election administrators uh, don't want to see themselves in the news and want to know that they carried out their job with integrity and fairness. Uh, and, and we need look no further than this last election. You had Secretary Rathersberger in, in Georgia, a Republican. You had Secretary Sagaski in Nevada, a Republican. You had Tina Barton in Michigan, standing up Republicans, taking accountability and owning the process because that was their job. That was the oath that they took. Uh, and that's consistent with my experience in elections over, over uh, now 15 plus years, I'm getting old, uh, in, in working with these folks. As soon as they take that oath, their, their commitments to the process, to our democracy, uh, and we saw that play out in this election. That doesn't mean we shouldn't have checks. We shouldn't recognize that a bad actor might not end up in that position. And that's why uh, the process has uh, checks, balances, and, and ways to hold uh, people accountable. Uh, but in the end, I, I think we saw in this election that the goodness of election officials was critical uh, to us having a, a successful election. Yeah, Jocelyn or Katie, were you in touch with some of your Republican colleagues in the aftermath of the election? Yeah, we talk weekly. Um, all the, this, we have weekly meetings every every week. Uh, but in addition to that, um, particularly myself, Secretary Hobbs, Secretary Sagafsky, and Secretary Raffensperger um, were in close and sometimes nearly daily contact with each other, as well as Secretary Bookfar, the then Secretary of State in Pennsylvania, where we talked often about our unique challenges, supported each other, and, and several of our colleagues did as well. I, Katie, I, I know you know you and I were. Um, <laughs> shared a lot of experiences um, throughout the whole process. Well, we're, we are almost out of time. This has been a terrific discussion. I'm going to do a, a last uh, lightning round, as it, as it were. Based on your experience and what you saw last November, what would be the uh, number one change to improve our election system you would recommend? Matt, we'll start with you. We'll start with the feds. 
<laughs> well, not having the feds uh, tell the states. No, uh, that without question, having full auditability uh, votes. This election had 94, 95% of ballots cast were on auditable paper records. We need to, to ensure that 100% of votes cast in the upcoming election has that. And not only that, that we're doing good, efficient, transparent auditing. Uh, of those results so that voters can interact and, and understand, look at the evidence uh, to have confidence. And, and then the second one I'd say is elevating election officials' voices. Uh, we need platforms like uh, the social media platforms and, and Google to ensure that the trusted info from election officials is prioritized, is pushed. If I do a Google search about Michigan elections, I should get Secretary Benson's websites and the facts, uh, not some of the conspiracy theories. So th those are the two that I'd start with. Katie? Well, I think Matt uh, brought up some great points. I would love the ability to just make voters listen to what I had to say and to listen to the truth. Um, in the absence of that, I think um, investing uh, robustly in public education campaigns, giving election officials the ability to communicate directly with the people that need the information. Okay, good. Josh? I would note for the record, you've asked all of us for one thing and Matt gave at least two or three. So <laughs> I'm not going to be bound by, by the way. Now, I, I agree with the, the, the comments of my colleagues. I think above all else, um, leaders need to speak and act with moral clarity. And, and we lost that for quite a bit of time. And that's not about your perspective on one issue or another. It's, it's about speaking with moral clarity, adhering to our constitution. And so I would say that is above all else, the most important thing. There, there are certainly some changes to our election laws here in Pennsylvania that we need to make. Um, but overall, I think we need to get back to you know, a common set of facts and actors who are willing uh, to act with moral clarity. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. And I, I, of course, I agree with everything that's said. And to me, it also underscores the need for sustainable funding and resources to invest in our elections, whether it's about educating voters countering misinformation or just supporting and building the infrastructure of a secure and accessible democracy. It is to me um, ridiculous that the most important thing we do as a country hold elections to ensure and select who has power to make every other decision on our behalf is so severely underfunded. And every so many of the challenges from educating voters to auditing the election and everything in between that we encountered this year could have been significantly avoided or, or eliminated with appropriate funding. And we asked for it from the federal government. We've asked for it from our states, but I do think every single leader who has a stake in ensuring our democracies are accessible, fair and secure must put resources behind that uh, and really invest in our local and state election administration so that we can do the job that we've been elected or selected to do of educating citizens about their rights, making sure they have the tools and resources to exercise their vote, and then supporting and investing in our election administrators as they tabulate and secure the process. Very good. This was excellent. I'll just close by saying on behalf of a grateful nation, I am so glad you were in your roles um, uh, during this turbulent period. Uh, you were really needed and you stepped up to the plate beautifully and uh, I'm grateful. Uh, and okay. I know lots of other folks who are very grateful. So thank you for joining the panel today. Uh, and uh, I hope our paths cross again. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you, everybody. Hey, everybody.